Hey, welcome to another episode of MexPunk Florida's Neurotransmissions Podcast. I'm Joe Schumacher. And I'm Leslie Colgan. Today we're going to be talking to Professor Ole Keen, who is a pioneering figure in the study of locomotion. He's also the 2022 recipient of the Brain Prize for having revolutionized our understanding of the neuronal cell types and circuits underlying movement. We're going to hear about the technical challenges of this work and also um, how this reshapes our understanding of motor control in both health and disease. Enjoy the show. Our guest today is Professor Ole Keen. Uh, he is Professor in Integrative Neuroscience and Motor Control at the University of Copenhagen, as well as the Department of Neuroscience at the Karolinska Institute. And his research group has been defining circuits for locomotor movement in health and disease. Um, I also found out that he's the president-elect of the FEN Society, uh, which he'll be taking over next year. So Congrats. That's exciting. Thanks. Um, Welcome to the podcast. We're so glad you joined us. Thank you. I'm very happy to be here. So throughout your career, you've really um, made tremendous contributions to us understanding how we move and locomotion. And I'm curious, before we really dive into that science, is there something in particular about the way that we move that attracts you to study this question? I think that movement is really one of the fundamental things that we're doing. We, uh, as a, we kind of do it all the time. We use our body to move. We use it when we speak, when we breathe. We use it when we walk around. So in a sense, it's the brain's physical expression in the world. It's what the brain, when the brain is active, we see our movement. So we m use movements in almost any daily activities. So it's a direct uh, insight into the brain when we watch movement. And that is, for me, an attractive way of uh, looking at brain activity. Just sort of that it's like one of the most fundamental components of our day-to-day our -day lives, basically, that it, it, it kind of is the central feature and like functional role of the brain, in your opinion? Yeah, th in some sense, I think it is, because we, we're so dependent on it, it's what it's the only way that we can interact with in our environment. We use it when we eat, when we breathe, when we walk around, when we try to find our way. We use it all the time. Yeah. yeah. Even when we talk. Even when we talk. <laughs> I mean, so you've been, you've been um, studying motor circuits for a long time in your career. Um, you know, early on, um, uh, you, you know, your work focused heavily on the spinal cord. Um, you discovered plateau potentials in the spinal, spinal cord, from what I understand. Can you describe a little bit about what a plateau potential is and what it's important for in terms of controlling our muscle movements? Yeah, I started, I, I'm a medical, I started, I started medicine. And as I moved along in my, as a medical student, I decided that it, I would like to do research. I, actually couldn't really see myself as a medical doctor. So I went up to a lab, the Hans Hultbond's lab, where he has been studying the spinal cord and motor control for a very long time. And some of the first experiments I got engaged in was in his lab where we uh, found plateau potentials that are in motor neurons. Motor neurons are the cells that are directly controlling our muscles. And the view of motor neurons is that they just received input and were like passively receiving the input and didn't do anything to that input. So when plateau's potentials are present in motor neurons, they work as what we could call a bistable switch. They go from one state to another state just in response to a very short uh, stimuli. So instead of just interpreting that stimuli, they actively interpret that stimuli. That is what a plateau potential is. It goes from one state to another state. And we think of it as uh, can be used, for example, during postural activity, that uh, you just get a short input from the, from the brain to the spinal cord, and then when you trigger the plateau potential, you turn it into a prolonged activity. And, and it's, you know, it's interesting that like over the, the course of your career, you're, you've 
you know, expanded to cover such a wide range of different functions of the motor system, not just from the level of the spinal cord, but up into the brain, brainstem, mm. midbrain, all these sort of things. Um, what has been some of the, the guiding principles that sort of have decided what sort of questions you think are the, the most interesting to ask, like from plateau depend- potentials to today, like how do you decide what the, what's the next thing to study? I mean, um, it seems like uh, there's so many different ways to go. Like wh- how, how do you as a scientist decide what's next? There's a bit of history involved in this. I've always been a, in, in a sense, I've always worked on the motor system. I started in the spinal cord, uh, which is more than 35 years ago, and I've stayed in the motor system for, for that long. And as that time developed, it became clear to me that we needed to kind of understand the functional organization of those circuitries. Those circuitries are very complex. If you just look at them, we cannot understand them. Cells, this, the spinal cord is not just a cable going from the brain uh, to our muscle. There are millions of cells in the spinal cord. And that complex network, that some of the questions we, I wanted to answer is, how is this network organized? How can it produce the complex motor behavior? And in order to do that, we needed to go in and look at the individual cells try to figure out how are these cells organized and what are their contribution to those to the motor behavior from individual population Mm -hmm. and we figured out you cannot just look at them you needed to be able to change the activity turn them on and off and see how that affected the motor behavior yeah yeah and that came that development came as I was moving along, traditionally being uh, the, what we call a, a neurophysiologist that use electrical uh, mic, ele- electrodes to record the activity. Simultaneously, the, the, the molecular part uh, developed uh, in the field, and we could use those methods to try to change activity of nerve cells in the spinal cord and thereby directly link the different populations of activity to the output. So these technical developments sort of grew along with your questions, enabling you to ask sort of the next questions that you were interested in. That's correct. I originally worked uh, on the cat spine court, but then decided to move on to, uh, in some sense, simpler preparation of the rodent spinal cord, which we could isolate completely from the, from the animal, have it outside the body. And this, even though it's isolated from, uh, the, from the animal, it can produce what looks like a, a locomotor activity. And that gives us great opportunities to try to dive into the network and see those cells in the spinal cord, uh, give them names and uh, try to understand how they together produce the activity. Um, so um, when you're, you're looking at sort of a, a spinal cord in and of itself, generating what you say is, is locomotor-like activity, what are the signatures of a locomotor activity in the spinal cord? So the signature mm-hmm. is that you need to, uh, locomotion is a very complex behavior. It's not just left and right, uh, it involves left and right. You need to have uh, out of phase activity between the two sides in in order to be able to walk. But within a limb, you also have many muscles that control the the hip, the knee, the ankle, and those muscles need to be activated in a specific pattern, in a specific sequence, which is actually a very complex task. And then on top of that, you need to have a pace, a rhythm. So all of this needs to come together. And what we have found out is that, that different neuronal populations in the spinal cord control the different aspects of this, the rhythm, left, right, and flex extensor, uh, the, 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 the precise activity between the different muscles. So what appears to be simple is actually very complex um, and why we think it's simple is that when we walk, we don't think about it. 
because we have placed that, that we have delegated that job of these different, the rhythm, uh, left, right, and, and coordination between the different muscles to neural networks in the spinal cord itself. So you kind of have the engine down there. And when you activate that engine, it takes over. You don't have to think about putting one foot in front of the next foot, thinking left and right. It does it automatically. But it cannot do it unless you get a signal from the brain. Mm -hmm. We all know that if you have a spinal cord injury, you cannot walk if it's a full spinal cord injury. But there's nothing wrong with the engine. The engine is still in the spinal cord. The network is there. It just is lacking the signal from the brain to be turned on. So I guess to follow up, the, the idea is that you have this sort of intrinsic program built into the, the spinal cord that you can define like molecularly by cell types and these sorts yeah. of things. And then the next question is, how do you engage the specific aspects yeah. of the program with commands like down from the top right. from the brain? Yeah, it's very interesting. So, so, what, I'd, so what I'd decided to do uh, was to try to understand the network in the spinal cord as kind of the fundamental issue about locomotion and then move up into the brainstem and see how the brain, what is needed from the brainstem in terms of start signals and stop signals to engage that network. And in some of your more recent work, you have been, you know, found some really interesting subpopulations that you talked about a little bit in your talk this morning, which I found really interesting. Um, for example, you talked about these two separate regions which um, control different speeds of locomotion. Um, I think it was the CNF and PPN, right? Is that right? Yeah, the cuneiform <laughs> nucleus, what we call CNF in, in, in short, uh, PPN, the peduncular pontine nuclei. And these are two structures in the midbrain uh, that we found are involved in initiating locomotor activity, but also setting the speed of locomotion. And it do it in a little different way where the CNF is important for the very fast speed, what we see if, if an animal has to walk very fast or we have to walk very fast or it has to escape from an enemy, then it would need the CNF and the peduncular pontine nuclei is important for what we call explorative locomotion. It's like walking around, finding your way, going to to a certain area in a slow uh, way. So these two uh, structures are really important for that initiation. For initiation, we call them start neurons uh, because they start the locomotor activity and they control the speed of locomotion. Um, and in four-legged animals, you would see that the speed leads to changes in the locomotor pattern we know it all from horses that walk slow, they have walking, they go into trot, and eventually they go into gallop. And one aspect about this that I found really interesting, if I remember correctly, is that um, some of the experiments you were actually doing were stimulating these specific uh, nuclei. And I believe the speed of the locomotion was somewhat also tied to the stimulus strength that you gave. This is correct. So the faster you stimulate, which was correspond to that a cell type produces more action, potentially more spikes. Uh, the faster we stimulate, the faster the animal would go. That's really interesting. Another aspect that I thought was really interesting was the idea that these, the fact that you had these two separate um, nuclei that were controlling these different aspects of locomotion um, sort of, as you mentioned, hinted at this context-specific control of locomotion and that they actually might be receiving, you know, different information based on their context. And you actually, I think, investigated some of the upstream brain regions that they were uh, getting information from. Yeah, so what we have done is that this is one of the big issues in neuroscience is to f understand if you know a region of cells, what kind of input do they get? And that's not a complete trivial question to answer. And we have recently uh, been fortunate uh, enough, uh, 
not a technique that we have developed, but other people have developed, is that to use a methods that allow you to look at the immediate cells that connect to a given population of nerve cells. This is a variation of, 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 of uh, if you're bitten by a mad dog, rabies, the virus will go into your muscles and get into the motor neurons and then it will jump to the next cell. So this technique has just been slightly modified so instead of jumping endlessly in the brainstem, it just only jumps once. And that allows us to look at this input and we find many different brain areas that project to these two, the peduncular pontine nucleus and the uh, cuneiform nucleus, but they, it does it in, not in the same way. It's different regions that are connected to these two uh, structures, which we interpret in a way that uh, in specific contexts, different upstream nuclei will be activated and then activate either CNF or PBN to elicit these different locomotor behaviors. This is sort of a, uh, maybe not a fully thought out question, but I wonder w sort of why the brain would be organized in a way where seemingly like similar drives like to move forward, to like do these, um, to go, to start, would be sort of segregated into multiple different sort of modes. I mean, are there ever, can we sort of hypothesize or just sort of like fantasize of a situation where some type of brain lesion would lead one of these circuits intact and the other one not intact? Would an animal presumably sometimes be capable of escape behaviors but not foraging or capable of foraging but not escaping? Are, are there any like sort of like clinically relevant situations where, um, you know, these, these sort of um, distinctions between different types of going and starting would be um, relevant for us, like as people, or, you know, if we think evolutionarily, is there a certain level of redundancy by sort of having these sort of segregated functional roles? Is there anything you can speak to with that? that this is, I think, is an extremely interesting question. That we, I'm not aware of any clinical uh, syndromes that have segregated these two, but you could easily think that that would happen. I think from a behavioral point of view, you need, or we, it's, 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 it's kind of nice uh, to have pathways, for example, an escape pathway that can be recruited separately from the pathway that you will need to just walk around and do explorative. Because this is what you need if, you are, if, if an animal uh, is, is suddenly need or we suddenly need to, you know, have high speed which we can do, we can go from zero to very high speed. An animal can do that. They can go from zero to gallop in, in, in a few steps. So it seems that you can press that button in a specific context. Um, uh, so I think from a behavioral point of view, it makes sense. Uh, but we were also kind of surprised when we found it because we were looking for one structure. This was the way that the people generally perceive these regions. And, and when we described it, uh, the, the entrance point to understand it was actually the speed. And it was mm. by looking at the speed that these two different nuclear controlled that we understood that there were two different regions. Yeah. And then by the anatomical, the, 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 uh, revealing the input structure to those uh, two structures or the input to these two structures, we kind of get confirmed that they could be recruited separately uh, in different contexts. Yeah, and I, I suppose it does make a certain amount of like intuitive sense that um, a sort of thoughtful sensory uh, type of like integration foraging behavior would require different inputs and therefore would want to be regulated completely differently yeah. than thoughtless run away, I don't want to be eaten by a predator type right. behavior. So I guess on a certain level, even though we think of moving around as moving around in our day-to-day -day lives, like there is real reason and it makes a lot of sense in retrospect when you look at your data that way. I guess another um, sort of really interesting functional subunit of 
uh, of, uh, of neural control that you described um, today in your seminar um, is stopping. You know, we, we think of locomotion as locomoting around, but obviously you need to know when to stop. You don't want to run into a wall. Right. You can't go forever. Describe a little bit about, you know, this sort of complementary work that you've done and some of the cell types you've discovered that are involved in stopping. So when we, the, the finding the stop neurons, which is in, a, in an area of the brainstem that we call nucleus digentocellulose, it's just a name. This is the, many of these names in the brainstem were given at a time where people looked at the brain and they were given by very you know, skilled uh, neuroscientists mm -hmm. or neuroanatomists, mm -hmm. and they gave them names. So many of the names make no real sense. This is the nucleus of the big gigantic cells. Yeah, or this yeah. is exactly what it is. <laughs> yeah. uh, so it's an anatomical description. We found those cells in a search for the start cells. I was very convinced that those cells that we now have named stop cells were the cells that would initiate the locomotor activity. So we did this classical stimulation experiment, which is uh, optogenetic uh, stimulation experiment, and saw that it was through no activity, nothing happened. Uh, and then we did the other experiments where, with the isolated uh, 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 brainstem preparation and saw that if there was a locomotor-like activity, we could stop it. And then we eventually went in vivo and found that stimulating those cells lead to what we call an intentional stop because it looks like you stop with an intention when you reach a goal, uh, walking to the door, trying to open it, walking down to the refrigerator to find a, you know, milk or whatever it is. Uh, uh, and but it was a what we call a serendipity finding. We were looking for something else and found this. And then we have taken that discovery further to try to see how that is integrated into locomotor behavior. And in that search, we also found that those cells is also engaged in another important behavior, which is whether you have, whether you, you need it when you want to turn to the left and to the right. Yeah, that was actually like kind of surprising to me. So one of the one of the things that that stuck out was that the neurons that you've identified in this this region for stopping are excitatory neurons. They're not neurons yeah. that you might think that if we have a, a set of neurons in the brain that are going to stop us from moving, they're going to be inhibitory. They're going to shut down activity or something like that. But they're they're excitatory. And you mentioned that um, they they must be integrating with these sort of motor programs within the spinal cord itself yeah. that are themselves inhibitory. They're sort of like excitatory neurons targeting inhibitory structures. Yeah. Is that right? That's correct. So this is a trick that the brain often plays. Uh, you have right. disinhibition uh, and things like yeah. that. Yeah. So you have, uh, you can make sound reversal by introducing another population of cells. And this is exactly what happened here. These cells are excitatory. We went to many experiments to really make sure that they do not release any inhibitory transmitters. Mm -hmm. uh, so the only explanation we had is that they act on inhibitory circuitries in the spinal cord. So they send an excitation down to the spinal cord, and then when it reaches the spinal cord, that excitation is converted into inhibition by acting on inhibitory cells down there, which in, then in turn inhibits the rhythm. Mm -hmm. Um, and why the brain will like to do that, I don't know. Uh, they could have had, you know, a direct inhibition down to the spinal cord. But presumably, by introducing an extra neuron in the spinal cord, you introduce flexibility. Um, because we know that in the spinal cord, this, the excitatory connection outside the limb region will be directly acting on motor neurons and cause an excitation. So when you turn, you both need to turn your body to one side, your head and your trunk, but you also need to change the limb. And in the body and, and head, it's a direct excitation. When you get down to the limb region, you have this inhibitory interneuron. So by having the same signal going down, you get this combined dual effect that you need to make the turn. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, the aspect of stopping neurons being central to turning, was that a surprise? I mean, it seems like um, I don't necessarily think when I need to take a turn that I'm, no. I'm making a stop. It but was... I do think when I'm, I'm riding a horse, I kind of feel like I'm sort of like causing the horse to stop. Yeah slightly when I want to make it a turn by pulling on the rein. Not that I'm like out here riding a horse very much, but like <laughs> that's kind of the analogy that pops into my head is sort of steering a horse. So um, was that kind of like a surprising result that the stopping and the turning would be so It was linked surprising to each other? and uh, uh, it was, uh, I have a very extremely uh, uh, talented, extremely good uh, postdoc Jerry Craig who came to my lab and he wanted to work on this and we uh, hypothesized and, 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 and went after it together that uh, that these turning neurons or the stop neuron could Im by having a um, by breaking the locomotion on one side would be able to turn uh, make the turn and Jared went after this and, 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 and showed, you know, brilliantly how, how it works. And the way that we uh, thought about it is that it's a little bit, little bit like a car where you have a differential gear so that mm -hmm. the, 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 the wheels can move at different speeds on the, on, on the two sides. Yeah, like a dual differential. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, you know, one of the other things that sort of like really stands out from this work, you have, you know, these distinct subregions in the brainstem interacting with specific spinal motor circuits, driving like completely independent functions or, or complementary functions, I would say, like all these things are probably operating simultaneously at all times when we're, when we're locomoting, but, you know, not just in a normal, healthy locomotion situation, like in sort of mo ma d disorders of motor control, I imagine this plays an important role. So diseases like Parkinson's disease, mm -hmm. which are, you know, sort of, sort of stem from, you know, dopamine neurons in the basal ganglia dying off and, you know, cascading effect to downstream regions, like causing lots of different pathologies. How do some of these individual components like turning, stopping, uh, starting, um, factor into things like Parkinson's disease. Are there any, do these present, like by identifying these individual types of circuits, maybe new targets for understanding how to treat some of the specific symptoms of Parkinson's disease? Or do all, does Parkinson's disease sort of just sort of blanket cover all these things all at once and you really need to just sort of focus at the most upstream component? Um, we think that we, by focusing on some of these descending or of this descending pathway, are able to at least alleviate some of the symptoms. One of the major symptoms that there are several major symptoms that Parkinsonian patients motor symptoms that they suffer from. One is that they have this slow locomotor activity, that they have freezing of gates, they have problems with turning uh, to the left and to the right. And these are exactly the features that we have described in this command system and in animal experiments where we can not make Parkinson because there are no, there are no animal models that really are making them like Parkinson, but we can make Parkinson-like symptoms with motor symptoms. We have been able to, in those animal models, to really uh, alleviate some of the, or, you know, improve the motor function by stimulating the start cells and to uh, make the turning uh, better uh, in those animal models. So we think that there are possibly by t targeting more of one or more of these descending pathway could be able to uh, uh, improve motor symptoms in Parkinson. Do you know in Parkinson's disease, like, <clears throat> You know, um, actually, one of my, my first jobs in neuroscience um, was working in a, a lab that studied humans with Parkinson's disease. Um, shout out to the great uh, Pietro Mazzoni um, and John Krakauer for hiring me for that job. But, um, you know, I, a lot of times they, they present with um, uh, 
we were studying motor learning actually in, in people with Parkinson's disease at the time. I, they were studying it. I was a grunt helping them with whatever task they would let me do. Um, I, you know, a lot of the things that stand out, tremor, um, freezing of gait was something they were really interested in. Um, the, the video you showed of a, Parkins, a Parkinson's patient turning, I, I hadn't seen that before. It was, it's very obvious when you elicit that behavior. These sorts of symptoms that are present in Parkinson's disease, given that they sort of, you know, motor control is so complex and distributed throughout so many different sub-circuits, um, you know, in the progression of the disease, do all of these things kind of get affected simultaneously, or do you see individual types of symptoms pop up independently? Could you imagine that, you know, like slow walking circuits or, you know, start and stop circuits or, you know, turning, um, these sorts of things sort of happen independently? Um, is, is there anything known about how that happens in the actual, like, progression of the disease? I have to be careful here because I'm not working in the clinic. Sure, I'm sure, sure that's that um, people working with Parkinson's uh, patients will be able to answer that question better than I am. Mm. Um, but um, it's my impression that this slow progression of the affect motor behavior on a general, uh, you know, you start to, to have, for locomotion, you start to have a slowing of, of, of the movement. And then eventually in the very uh, severe case, you have these F uh, freezing of movement where the where the person experienced that that uh, the feet are glued to the ground and this often happen in in cases where they have to you know navigate a, a, for example a pool and then they also exp you know show problems with turning mm -hmm. so the stop this freezing of gait is also involving the turning problem um, in terms of the tremor, that is different from... It's a separate phenomenon. It's a separate yeah. phenomenon that is also better cured by what we call deep brain stimulation mm -hmm. because there's an area in the brain where you can cure the, the, the tremor by, by electrical stimulation, uh, which is very efficient, unlike what has been shown for, for the locomotor behavior. Interesting. I wonder if you might be able to comment, you know, we've made a lot of progress um, with things like deep brain stimulation and um, for, you know, patients with motor disorders um, and also in, you know, restoring function to some spinal cord injury patients. Are there specific hurdles that you see in your mind that we have yet to overcome in order to really understand how we might be able to restore, you know, locomotion to patients affected by these disorders or injuries? In terms of the deep brain stimulation, one of the issues is the unspecificity of the electrical stimulation, uh, including the fact that uh, that effects can be dependent on the stimulation frequency, which often is interpreted in a way that sometimes the, the, the stimulation will cause inhibition of the cells at high frequencies and then at lower frequencies it will cause excitation. So you can have the whole spectrum of, of effects by changing the stimulation. But the main issue with electrical stimulation is that it doesn't stimulate specific cell populations and current has to tend to spread indiscriminately. So when we do the, our oxygenetic experiments in animals, we have specificity in terms of cell population, but also in terms of local, uh, that, that, that the area we stimulate is often more localized. Mm. In terms of spine cord injury, there are all the problems with regaining motor function because the, there's a break f from the brain to the spine cord and um, this is uh, obviously a huge field that where the, where the main issue is to, to you know, get the signal transformed from the brain to the, below the injury. But interestingly enough, there is, it is so that um, understanding how the circuitry is composed also give us better insight to what kind of cells, what type of cells that should be stimulated in the spinal cord. 
So what do you see next for your research? Um, is there anything that's going on in the lab right now that you're particularly excited about that you can share with us? I'm actually very excited about trying to understand how these signals are integrated, how this command pathway integrates signal from higher brain structures to get the combined uh, behavior elicited in in specific context. Um, this is one of the things that are very difficult to understand when you have regions that receive input from many different regions of the brain or structures that receive input from many regions of the brain and uh, the upstream structures that send signal to many different downstream structures. How is all of this integrated when we actually do behavior in the living uh, animal or humans? So this is, these are hard questions to, to get at. And I think we have some handles to try to do it now. So that's what we would like to do. Well, well, it's very exciting. Um, we're just about out of time here. So um, thank you so much for, for joining us here on the podcast and uh, all the best and enjoy, en enjoy Floyd while you're here. Thanks for having me here. Absolutely. Pleasure. Thanks for joining us. Okay, so that was, uh, that was our interview with uh, Professor Keen. What did you think? I thought it was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I, I learned a lot. I, I've always had this very textbook view of how motor control works. I think, you know, going is going, stopping is stopping, turning and stopping never would have occurred to me that would be controlled by like the same, you know, individual molecularly defined cell types. Um, you learn something new every day on this podcast or, you know, l listening to these talks here. Um, I want to take the opportunity to... Uh, thank producer Kevin. Last time we did one of these video podcasts, I said, we need a camera on producer Kevin. Can we get this feed? Can we get this in the feed? There's yes, Kevin. Yes, okay, so I'm Kevin. right here. Hi, Kevin. Welcome hi, to Kevin. the show. That's your voice. Say hi again. I, I, Hello, I'm right here. Yeah. Um, so um, I have a bone to pick with you, though. Like, so now we're doing this video <laughs> podcast, and I went like this. I said, this is where producer Kevin is going to insert some really clever graphics or something, or he's not going to put something here and leave me hanging. And make it, and you left me hanging. Yeah, I put nothing there. Right. So I, I, I'm demanding now. I'm looking into the camera, and I'm gesturing right here. I want you to put something here that just like demonstrates that you have like the technical abilities that I know you have, that you're not just make, taking shortcuts and uh, being lazy. I mean... This room is a shambles, by the way. I've like, got the perfect thing. Okay, great. Okay, cool. So so from now on, when I'm talking or when Leslie's talking, we're going to have graphics that are basically like, you know, helping to explain what we're talking about, right? Yeah. Okay, well, I think it's a good so. idea. Let's not get too excited. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, um, thank you all for listening. Um, anything else? I think that's it. Another great podcast <laughs> in the books. Check you later. Thanks for watching today. If you like this video podcast, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel for more cool neuroscience.